Um, about ten years ago, I, um, I woke up one morning in a, uh, a hotel in um, Palo Alto in California. And um, I had a new experience, which was, was about 8.30 in the morning. Stretch limos came and collected me and 14 colleagues from the BBC and took us to a place called Stanford Research International in Menlo Park. Have you heard of Stanford, SRI? Um, and we're greeted there by the chief executive, um, a guy called Kurt Carlson. Um, and he takes us into the lobby where there's a, there's a plinth about this size, and it has a perspex box on top of it. Uh, and inside there's this strange little wooden thing with a sort of piece of cord coming out of it, made of, and it's about the size of a large matchbox. And uh, Carlson explains to us that this is the first computer mouse that was ever made, built by um, a team under a guy called Doug Engelbart. Have you heard of Doug Engelbart? Um, a few people have, that's good, that's unusual. <laughs> um, and he said, you know, people think about Xerox, people think about Apple, but actually everything that we still use as the basic interface with computers was developed here by Engelbart uh, and his team in the late 60s. Um, and he said, and do you know what we did with it? We licensed that technology to two organizations, to Xerox and to Apple, for $50,000 a piece. Um, you know, obviously, I wasn't here at the time. Nevertheless, I occasionally wake up sweating, thinking if we had a dime for every mouse that had ever been made. And his point was, he said, here at SRI, we have 2,500 research scientists, 1,500 of them have PhDs. They're all doing something interesting. But how can we tell of the research that these people are doing which of them are actually going to create value? They all have approaches. Some are fascinated with the properties of polymers. Some are fascinated with how many circuits you can get onto a piece of silicon. But they can't tell you why they're doing that. They're just fascinated by that stuff. So he introduced a value, what they call a sort of value creation system at SRI. Um, and at the heart of it, the first question, you, if you're looking for, for further resources for a project you want to develop, the first question you have to ask, answer is, what is the need that you're meeting? What is, the, what is the human need? What's the social need? What's the commercial need that the approach you've got, the idea you've got, might actually meet? And it was the first time, really, I'd had um, anyone explain to me quite so forcefully the importance of putting users, putting humans, at the center of a design process. The other thing that was interesting for me was that the development process, the value creation process at SRI, is based around pitching. That at every stage of a project's development, what you're required to do is to put together a pitch for that project in which you have to, and the first, and, and, and there are four questions that you have to answer in the pitch. But at the, heart, the first and the most important one is that one around what's the important need that you're trying to meet. Um, and that's, um, I mean, that, th this was in a hardcore science and engineering technology research center. But what was interesting was that I was there with a group of 15 people from the BBC, um, and that way of thinking, which was actually probably quite alien to people from creative backgrounds, played very well into the BBC's own needs and own needs in terms of development. And I've been making a living out of this week. I had an SRI ever since, passing this on. What I've done for the last 15 years is run a series of events called labs, short-term, very intensive development project, um, environments for people developing what we now have to call transmedia projects. And again, what, one of the, you know, I'd always thought that pitching and presentations are important 
Um, and what I learned at SRI just reinforced that. Um, so what I've come to is that in developing a project, there are five stories that you have to tell about the project that you're developing, um, which I'll just run through. The first one is, of course, you have to have a story story. You, know, you have to have a great story. Twas ever thus. I think the difference now in developing what we call transmedia projects is that whereas sort of 20 years ago, and I remember talking recently to a, a commissioning editor from the VPRO, which is uh, one of the Dutch public sector broadcasters, she said, you know, 20 years ago it was easy. You know, if I was commissioning a documentary, I'd know exactly when it, the audience was going to watch it, I'd know exactly where they were going to watch it, I'd know, you know, I'd know everything about the context of use. Now, you really know very little about the context of use. So the second story that you have to be able to tell is, going back to Carlson SRI, is a user story. You have to put, from the start, I think, of developing any project, you have to, have a, you have to begin to develop an idea of who you're making this for, how they use the media that are available to them. You have to get their attention. You know, this is, this is a time when it's never been easier to publish, to create content. It's never been harder to get attention. And if you get attention, you have to hold on to it. So understanding users, understanding their needs, understanding how what you're doing is relevant to their lives, designing something which they're going to understand, making the thing that you're doing people-shaped is absolutely fundamental. So that's my second story. You have a story story, you have a user story. The third, which plays into the, the, the user story, is the platform story. You need to understand, you know, I, I hate the term 360 because it doesn't make any sense at all. There are some platforms which it is appropriate for you to use, there are some which it's not. So understand why you're using each platform you're using and which bit of the story you're going to get across that. And again, going back to the user story, how that plays into the user's lives. My fourth story, have I got to four? <laughs> is the impact story. What effect do you expect to have? It's a, it's, it, this plays also actually into one of the questions in the SRI pitch. Their, their, their question is, what are the quantifiable benefits of what you're trying to do to meet a user need? So that may be a commercial benefit, but it may be a social benefit. Maybe if you're trying to do an educational project or a, or a social project of some kind. But develop an answer to that and make it quantifiable. It's not enough just to say, well, you know, it'll, it, it'll, um, you define a user need and then you say, this is how I'm going to meet it. And then you just say, well, it'll meet the need. If you're working on something which is a commercial product, then know what the size of the market is know how much of that market you expect to get, have a quantifiable answer in terms of, of revenue. So, or, but it may not, but in, in many cases, you may not be doing something that's purely commercial. You may be doing something that's educational. You may be doing something that's got a social value. So think about what the quantifiable impact of your project will be. Um, and I think my final story is you have to have a money story. Um, and I think, I think the bad news here is I think as far as the money story is concerned, there is no such thing as transmedia. <laughs> Nobody is commissioning transmedia projects. Apart from, we were talking to Mark about this earlier, and we came to the conclusion there is, there is currently one broadcaster in the world commissioning transmedia projects, which is Arte. Um, but in the, you know, in the UK, uh, ten years ago, BBC was experimenting with transmedia projects. It's given up. <laughs> um, Channel 4 in the UK, still slightly more adventurous than the BBC, but they've, they, basically what they're doing is marketing or finding ways of you know, extending the experience of television on other platforms. So I think in, uh, probably, you know, in, I, I, mean, I can't remember all the examples Asta gave, but I would say... If you look at where those projects started, they all started on one platform. And 
you know, I, I'd just come back from Canada where I, where I was talking to a, a group of people about monetizing transmedia. And in the research I was doing, doing around that, I, I, I find that unless, you, unless you're looking at perhaps arts funding or museum funding, there are very, very few people, if anybody, who want transmedia projects. What they want is uh, IP on a single platform initially, which they can then extend across other brands. But I think, I don't know, Mark, Matt, you might contest this. But, but I would say... I would say But, but, but I, I would say with newspapers, they're desperately trying to, f trying to find a solution to a broken business model. Exactly. Um, and I think in, in, in almost every case, of where the, what the money story is about is um, slicing and dicing the licensing around IP across different platforms. Um, so that's kind of what... I, and so, you know, my... my, my I think what I'm trying to share with you is after the, after the last sort of 15 years, as I say, working people with people to develop what we now call transmedia projects. I think you need, with varying emphasis depending on what you're doing, you need to develop those five stories. The story story, a user story, platform story, an impact story, and a money story. Okay, thank you.